The average number of new infections reported each day in regard to COVID in Uganda fell by more than 940 over the last three weeks, 65% of its previous peak. Perhaps this indicates that the lockdown has slowed infections. The latest statistics indicate that confirmed cases stand at 86,140, cumulative recoveries at 59,495, deaths stand at 2,062. Uganda has administered at least 1,058,094 doses of COVID vaccine so far. Assuming every person needs two doses, that's enough to have vaccinated about 1.2% of the country's po population. That's quite paltry. And the health ministry estimates that the country could witness a peak towards the end of month as we, turn, as we stand to witness a gradual decline. We're going to be discussing and interrogating the issue of vaccines um, with, an, with our guests this evening, you're watching uh, Citizen Voices. We are going to uh, probe issues to do with the availability of these vaccines. We are going to do, deal with issues to do with whether Uganda has the capacity to develop its own vaccine, given the fact that to do a vaccine you require a financial watchlist and um, a team of committed scientists. We're also going to interrogate the issue of uh, COVID nationalism, where we see the West holding vaccines, and this is to the detriment of poor countries, um, as this can result into this kind of vicious cycle if many people remain uh, un not vaccinated. But before I bring in the panel, uh, we're going to you know, get the views of the public um, in what we recorded. And by name is Vyansi Ismail a resident of Makere Nakulabi. Uh, it's good for me to take uh, the vaccine. However, it was unfortunate that uh, uh, the first session was made for those above 50 years, so I was not able enough to go and do what, take uh, the vaccine. I, I would like to pose a question to the minister, is that uh, what are the criteria or the credentials that they have put for those ones who are not able to access the vaccine, like those ones in the villages, because we know like we've been seeing each and every person yearning to get the vaccine. Kumanya gange nzeba mpita chaze Emanueli ni mtuze we nansana. Vaccine na ine chilo uze choku jeku ya na yato yoruda na zemu ni entiamu. Uruwe nsonga mkusoka batu gama anga bagena soka gomachi bakade bali miaka jia waguru. Kati ato uruwa gize ni wada ni batu gamba pena tukende tuwe gemye. Ate nsonge mu yaze nga batu gamba zibibaso ko gemachi bona gari ma biari ba ba wage mama zi ba wage madagari difu katika nani nati demo kwe ge masi nza kuvere ni ngamba ni ndeva angeme shadi ba dachuru njoo mche na ndani ba mugema ira na ngi nari aga do kunge mana eka chobuzi we ni zopo na mwe chacho kunge masi mani dagara chitu ediri ni no kuko zesewa kwa kunge maso singa chiri singa chiri nti edagara ubali teka kwa mche na ba musume saga mbedagara we tine we diti Yeri no kugeme waso, bera nsoboro okumanya nchi aze okungema, edagara liande tedere no liwanda ga. Woods and uh, what next? Uh, today we're going, this evening we're going to be discussing the issue of vaccines on citizen voices and our hashtag is Amplifying Citizen Voices. To discuss this um, topic uh, in detail is the Director of Clinical Services in the Ministry of Health, Dr. Charles Solaro, and uh, Mary Nanyanzi from Saudi Zawanainchi. Uh, to begin with you, uh, Doctor, uh, first things first, um, what are we witnessing now as we speak today in terms of this second wave? Are we seeing a decline in terms of uh, admissions of those uh, suffering from uh, the virus? Are we seeing a decline in the number of um, severely ill patients? Uh, please give us uh, an update. Yes, good evening viewers. I'm happy to be hosted in NTV today and really listening to the citizens' voices. I want first probably as you have indicated to start with um, what's the current update. Cumulatively we now have about 88,755 with about six, over 60,000 60, recoveries, actually 60,392. The active cases 
at turn at 996, which means that actually numbers admitted have, have reduced. The new cases reported today stand at 615, and this was based on the tests which were done on 5,318. And this gave in a, a, a positivity rate of about 11.6. Definitely the most preferred positivity rate would be probably less than five, meaning that the moment in you test, you get five people less out of 100. The deaths stand at 2,090, 96, meaning that we had new 28 new, new, new deaths. The vaccines we've administered on 1,139,260, 1, 1, and out of that 187, 185,170 have got their first dose. So it means that they are second dose. So it means that out of those who were eligible population, so far, because our eligible population, we're not talking of all the population, we're talking of people only above 18 years, it means that probably about 4%, not, not 1.2. That's, that's if you take the global, global picture. So that's where we stand now. Uh, doctor, just a follow-up question. We know that we need vaccines to be able to beat the virus. Um, and we talk about equity in terms of uh, vaccine distribution. We talk about, you the scientists talk about collaboration in terms of sh sharing research. But we've seen a trend by the Western countries, the rich countries. Um, I think as, I, as of today, they've purchased uh, close to 60% of the vaccines, uh, and yet they represent a, a, a smaller number of 16%. And the poor nations and low, the countries that are less developed uh, are, are left you know, in the dark. Um, Vaccine nationalism remains a very terrible question in this regard. Um, how can we see that uh, countries, typically like Uganda um, and other countries in Africa, you know, can have one kind of voice, concerted voice, to ensure that um, the rich nations can, you know, uh, heed, I mean, this clarion call and be able to, you know, come to, to our aid and um, so that we can have a, a kind of equitable distribution of these vaccines to end this vicious cycle of uh, the COVID pandemic. Thank you for the, for the question. I want first to start that vaccines are the, are the safest and the most cost effective proven public intervention for prevention and control and even reduction of disease. And particularly in the absence of treatment for COVID, vaccines remains the biggest option in the country. As clearly you indicated, definitely we have noticed a lot of COVID vaccine inequities because most of the, most of the countries have vaccinated their good proportions. As you've seen, they are now opening up both socially and economically. But most of the countries like us, Uganda, definitely remain that we are only not able to vaccinate all the eligible populations. Because first, if you looked in the first phase, we had saw that we would vaccinate up to close to 4.8 million people. Those are the vulnerable groups, the health workers, the teachers, and those with comorbidities. But we have not been able to vaccinate it. So the key challenge is not issues of either availability of money, it's the issues of challenges of accessing what? Vaccines. The other options which would come definitely that you would get into the open market, go through the agents, but also there is also has also a biggest risk of fake, fake vaccines. So you have to trade very carefully. The COVAX facility was organized in that kind of arrangement to be able to, so that collectively could be able to access those countries, the low-income low countries could access almost 20%, vaccinate 20% of their countries. We are also trying to access vaccines through the African Union, but all of them definitely are having, having challenges. So, as you say, that definitely we need to be able to get our, our, our voices out because there is nobody who will be safe without all of us getting what? Vaccinated. The Western world will really be able to guarantee because we'll have a lot of pressure on the virus and there will be a creation of more variants 
and all of us will be at a risk. Whether, and that's why you have seen that even those countries which are fully vaccinated, they are now having what? So the best solution, and that's I think the appeal which uh, we come with as low-income countries, is that we need to be able to access vaccines and see how we get our, our populations vaccinated. Marie, to bring you in, um, as we speak now, we only have, uh, the estimate puts it that uh, with the entire vaccines that we've acquired as a country, we can only vaccinate about 1.2% of our population. What that simply means is um, we are going to continue facing challenges with um, a rise in terms of um, uh, variants that are going to you know, emerge if you have most of your population not vaccinated. The other challenge is the, the economy is going to, substantial part of the economy is going to remain locked out of, you know, participating because you can't have people come into places like Chukubo to do business. You can't have the other very productive sectors of the economy participate. Now, however, if we, we are able then to acquire uh, these vaccines in future, you've gone out there and you've, you know, spoken to the public. How can we ensure that um, fears of the public are laid so that we can have um, people coming out in large numbers to have this vaccine. What did you find out in terms of your research in regard to these you know, fears uh, in regard to vaccines? Thank you, Emma. Good evening, viewers. So uh, the research that we conducted did really show that there is a high percentage of Ugandans that are willing to get vaccinated. I think we saw about 90 93% that were willing to be vaccinated, but then they have some concerns. Some of those concerns are to do with the, uh, the level of knowledge they have about the vaccines. They talk about issues to do with the efficacy levels of those vaccines, because even when we look at the preference of uh, which vaccine they would uh, probably take, about 22% say that they would take any vaccine. But then we see that the other lot, we have those that uh, say that the one developed from the U.S. would be um, picked, is what they would take first. Then the second mention was that from the U.K., then from India, and then they rank the one from Russia and China at the bottom. So there is a need for that um, to be uh, for sensitization on efficacy levels, whether this works or it doesn't work. One of um, the other items or the other issues we discovered from this research is that as we were rolling out the, as the ministry was rolling out the most recent vaccination phase, where we were uh, calling upon those that were supposed to get the second dose to go in for that, the, it was hard to get to the locations. A number of people had to move long distances to get to those points, which became a barrier to get to the vaccination points, which implies that if at all we are to get the, already the demand is there, now we have to deal with the issue of the supply. So if at all those two are dealt with, then there is a need to uh, deal with the access so that you have more vaccination points within the localities so that someone does not have to walk seven kilometers to get to that location, especially for the older generation because at the moment it has been <coughs> stated clearly that yes everyone uh, who is above 18 is eligible but we have a prioritization within the ministry so there is a need to address some of that um, then the other issue that we did see from uh, this research is that there is a um, there is a need to also deal with some of the issues uh, to do with the safety some people believe that uh, if you have a certain condition, you cannot, you're not eligible or you should not get vaccinated. So it's, um, it's important that that is clearly stated because some people will depend on rumors and then uh, probably not go in for the vaccination. Those are some of the things that we did see coming out of the, of the research. Arib, um, the, you talk about um, your findings on the issue of efficacy. Um, but it, and it appears that uh, low developed countries are being given um, because you have no choice. Um, some, the vaccine of choice for, for 
for low developing countries like Uganda is AstraZeneca. And we've seen countries like the US say they won't use AstraZeneca and Australia, I think, the other day had restrictions. Um, there's a bit of politics uh, sometimes, perhaps maybe the scientists will tell us. But is this a matter of concern that poor countries, uh, countries in Africa are going to be at the mercy of, of the Western nation? And isn't this the time that, you know, the spirit of humanity, the spirit, that, that kindred spirit uh, should come at the forefront and the West uh, considers citizens in Africa as much as they consider their own citizens? Yes, indeed, you've stated it quite uh, clearly that it's important that the West considers the rest of us as uh, equal, even when we are coming from uh, low developed countries. And um, from what we have gathered from the residents of Kampala, we see that um, about 34% say that WHO and the international community is doing well in ensuring that poorer countries get access to the vaccines. I think they've heard about the COVAX facility and so on. Then we also see that 13% uh, say that um, they are not doing well. Then we have about 52% that are just there in the middle, which does uh, show us that for the majority of the uh, residents of Kampala or even the citizens of Uganda, that debate has not really been something that they talk about a lot. They look at purely the government to handle this issue and also to be able to negotiate or navigate better on how to ensure that we have increased supply of those vaccines because we see that um, about 24% um, about say that they believe that the government is doing a good job in handling this and also that they want the government to handle the responsibility of getting vaccines into Uganda. They do not expect private sector to do that. A very low percentage, about 8%, say that they would uh, expect private sector to deal with that. So they want the government to handle the vaccine acquisition for the citizens of Uganda. Uh, doctor, to bring you in, um, we've been discussing uh, the access of vaccines, and we know it's complex, actually. Uh, you, the scientists, say that it's not enough uh, to allocate a vote or put aside a portion of money. Um, so more or less we've been at the mercy of uh, what, what we can get from the other rich countries and the COVAX facility. But we've seen Kenya, for instance, say they are going to acquire 13 million doses from Johnson & Johnson. And uh, in, in 2022, they should be able to have vaccinated about 60% of their population. What, as a country, do we need to do? Uh, how can we bargain? Uh, who are those people we can rely on to see that we quickly bring in these uh, vaccines into the country? Because um, um, the repo effect is once we have enough vaccines, then they, our economy get, uh, goes back to, uh, comes out of you know, the tailspin that it's currently in. Okay, thank you for the question. I wanted first to give reassurance on the aspect of the efficacy because it shouldn't really derail people from getting vaccinated. First of all, the, the, the different studies of these vaccines have been done in different populations and different what, So probably that is not very comparable. But looking at first like AstraZeneca, which is the vaccine which we're using here, if, if you get your second dose tending towards 12, 12, 12 weeks, the efficacy actually increases up to up to 96%. So the AstraZeneca, any vaccine which has got efficacy over above 50 is as good as one. But as you know, even that, despite those, all those challenges people are talking of, but you're not able to access it. So if, if, if it is being produced, which means that it's being bought from people are what? Are buying it. So who are, who are buying it? So we should not be derailed because on that but looking at fiscal what is definitely the government is not sleeping is is working on how can we be able to get vaccines for the population of uganda and definitely there are different options one of it definitely can be direct purchasing of vaccine by government through the covax facility 
through COSIARI, where the government procures available vaccines through the COVAX. The challenge in this window is that it does not give us an advantage to jump the, the queue. Because if you are in a group, you have to follow the one. The other alternative is direct purchase of vaccine by government through the African Union, which I have mentioned. And, uh, I, and then the other one is directly purchasing from the private sector. And discussions are ongoing, but definitely this comes with a much more higher cost. And so government will look at all those options because as I, as I indicated in my opening statement, it's cheaper to vaccinate than to spend all the money on treatment, on the economy not flourishing, socially we have been locked down. So it's, it's cheaper that we spend whatever money, get the vaccines and have the population vaccinated. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, we're going to take a commercial break. When we come back, we'll discuss uh, about vaccines, specifically interrogate the issue of whether Uganda has the capacity to uh, develop our own vaccine. You're watching Citizen Voices, and we're headed for a commercial break. Watching Citizen Voices and our hashtag is Amplifying Citizen Voices. This evening on our panel, once again, is Dr. Charles Solaro, who is the Director of Clinical Services, the Health Ministry, and Marie Nanyanzi from South East uh, Wanainchi. Uh, doctor, um, before we took a break, we were talking about issues to do with the efficacy of the vaccine, but um, to discuss one of the, you know, recent of the pet subjects of the president, uh, he's been very keen about Uganda developing its uh, own vaccine. But you know, uh, it's not, it's a, quite a tall order f f to develop a, a vaccine. That doesn't mean that we can't do one. It requires a financial war chest. It requires committed scientists. It, it requires government's commitment. Um, do we have the cap? What, what does it take first and foremost for a country like Uganda to um, engage and be able to develop its own vaccine uh, to combat the COVID pandemic? Okay, thank you for that question. I think you heard from the president that I think the solution to many of these challenges which you are having where we're not able to access is to be able to produce our own vaccine. In terms of this, the science of production of vaccines, it's, it's known. I think the difficulty is the aspect of what is the investment in terms of equipment, which is what. So work is ongoing in this area. I might not be able to tell you to, to great detail how far it's what, but it's on, ongoing and uh, we, we think that we should be able to make vaccine and I hope it will come in time before we do one. Be, be able to be, as, as we go through this go through these challenges so this work is ongoing and uh, the details probably i will not be able to give give this because i would i would have loved the the person behind all this the who is the director of uganda virus institute himself to be able to speak over it uh, perhaps uh, just to share with us the process of how you develop a vaccine. You might, you get an anti antigen. And no, definitely there are different types of, of vaccines because you can have one which is attenu attenuate, attenuated, which is like you, the the virus is not, is not dead but is disabled. But if you look at like AstraZeneca, is is a dead virus, so, but going through an adeno and another, 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 another agent, the adenovirus, which is what? Which is introduced what? Then you can have messenger RNA viruses, which are, most of them are genetically engineered from the different parts of the world. And normally those parts which don't replicate are the ones which are used for making what? Vaccines. So you can have, there are different technologies which you can use to do what? Yeah, Mar Marie, to bring you in, uh, in regard to this question, for a vaccine to, you know, reach a certain threshold to be accepted and, you know, approved by the WHO and uh, the other uh, bodies, it requires that um, you conduct, I, uh, if I'm right, doctor, you conduct um, 
uh, clinical trials with uh, you know people after perhaps you've done one with uh, animals now in terms of perceptions about vaccines in Uganda you've gone out there and collected data how can we ensure that if Uganda is developing its own vaccine there's some kind of acceptance from the if we get to that stage that when we reach the stage to conduct clinical trials we are going to be, see people voluntarily you know coming out and having the confidence that they can you know these trials can be conducted how can we build that confidence if we still have you know other you know issues in regard to uh, perceptions about vaccines what is that that you've gathered uh, from the public um, thank you, Emmanuel. So uh, we have not uh, specifically asked a question about whether they would be willing to go in for a trial. But what we see so far is that, again, even the, the thought of Uganda should have its own vaccine, that that would increase the vaccination rate. This is only mentioned by 2% of those that reside in Kampala. So for now, I would only be speculating that this is what would uh, bring people on board to do the, the trial because that is a, a whole, I think there are a number of uh, factors that have to be put into consideration to see what would drive someone to go into that trial. So for that, I, I would only be speculating. Yeah, but specifically, mm -hmm. how, how about the perception on other on other on yes. vaccination generally yes. to increase yes. this uh what we see is that uh first of all there is that issue of uh, sensitizing ugandans more on the value of vaccination which uh that if you get this then if you get the shots then you'll uh, be better protected against the 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 virus and you won't probably uh, become uh, very ill and so on there is a need for that to continue that is about 37 percent that mentioned that then we have those that have mentioned reducing the distance between the home and uh, vaccination points uh, that is about 17 percent then we have those that say import more vaccines that would also drive more people to get the vaccination because at the moment we've had it i guess across uh, so many platforms that we have very few vaccines so that in a way can start to kill the morale of Ugandans and also probably uh, bring about some kind of uh, stress that you do not really see that uh, clear light ahead of uh, in that tunnel. Then we also see those saying that uh, in order for the vaccination rate to increase, that there's a need to deliver the vaccines at the health centers because we did see that in the last drive, there was a vaccination drive, there were a number of stations that were saying that they did not have the vaccine, yet they had been listed that they will have that, va that vaccine. So this was mentioned by about 8% of the residents of Kampala. Then we see that, uh, again, there's that issue of uh, more information on the vaccine being properly tested for safety, because you see social media also has a lot that is going on there in terms of now uh, issues to do with the, is this vaccine safe or not? That uh, aspect of is it some magnet issues that people are talking about. So there is a need to continually talk about uh, the safety of the vaccine. Then also having the vaccination going on door to door, because I think that would now bring more people on board as mentioned by the cities, uh, the residents of Kampala. Then uh, there's also the issue of making sure that these vaccines are free. We have already seen that the ministry has really communicated clearly that the vaccines are free. But we've also seen that some people have gone ahead to ignore that and paid some money to get vaccinated. So it's important that uh, the vaccines remain free and it's communicated clearly to the citizens of Uganda. Then making it compulsory, that was the least mentioned, that if this is made compulsory, then the vaccination rates will go up. But again, on the issue of Uganda developing its own vaccine, we only have about 2% of the residents of Kampala that believe that that is uh, something that can help to increase the vaccination yeah, rates. Marie, you talk about the question of safety. Mm -hmm. And uh, recently there was an incident in the media where uh, some unscrupulous officials, I think, injected uh, people with a fake vaccine. 
how is that going to perhaps affect um, the enthusiasm of uh, the public in regard to you know taking this vaccine if we're seeing a ray if, if we see that that kind of you know conduct um well it, it definitely does uh, have some effect but yeah we can't say that that effect will be lasting it's important to have continuous communication on this is the right vaccine if possible let the people be able to see the the packaging of what is right and also have um uh, clear information on the designated uh, points where they should uh, have that vaccine and also let those that have been um, the culprits be brought to book and have more enforcement because I, I think in the last drive there was for most of the vaccination centers or points you would find that there was uh, someone in uh, military overseeing the exercise or someone uh, a law enforcement officer was present I think that would also help to build more trust but yes that could affect the levels of trust in the vaccines but we cannot just leave it at that there's a need to really sensitize ugandans more on what is the fake and what is the the right vaccine doctor um let's talk about covidex um it's been uh, quite uh, a combustible subject in the media um it's not a vaccine uh, uh, but it's something that has been subjected to, I think, clinical trials and given a clean bill of health. But um, there's a perception out there from, you know, people who are taking it that perhaps it's a cure. Uh, there's a perception that perhaps it heals those who are critically ill and the West is trying to play politics. And there's also been, you know, a fight over, you know, ownership and all that kind of stuff. It's also now largely being sold on the black market. Tell us, what, what is COVIDx um, and how can you know, those who are suffering uh, or sick uh, with a virus be able to protect themselves by relying on this? Okay, thank you. COVIDx is a herbal extract. And I think the Professor Guang has spoken, spoken about it several, several times. But what I wanted to make is that definitely for, for us to be able to be certain whether it treats COVID or doesn't treat COVID, then you have to subject it to clinical what? randomized trial. That's the best practice. But what NDA has done is done that is approved it for use as a supportive, supportive therapy. And I think clearly indicated that it does not treat one. COVID. So I think right now the, the clinical trial is ongoing and it's only when we, we do get that, that's the difference we'll be able to give others a placebo which is, doesn't have the drug and give the others the real COVID X and then you see whether it's statistically significant, the results are there, then you can be able to, we can be able to pronounce ourselves that this is a treatment. But all of us are know that there are remedies, herbal remedies, which we have been using for, for a long time, and they have been able, some of them have been used for flu, for measles, and we think that this could be one of those which could be able to do one, be a game changer. So we really need to be able to look at it. I think this should be supported, should be supported, and seeing that how do we fast track it so that we can be able to, to see really, so that we can be able to make it now, I declare that actually it treats one, treats COVID. So yeah. it's work in progress, and I think we will be able to communicate. There's a theory out there that uh, the West is usually reluctant, doctor, to approve of, you know, uh, the scientific research, however good it is from Africa, uh, discoveries of, you know, drugs, including herbal medicine. How can we help uh, Professor Guang and uh, Uganda as a country to market COVID X if indeed we, we prove its efficacy in terms of you know treating the, the pandemic. I think we definitely don't need. Uh, well, I think we have we can be able to have the research here because the patients are killer. the numbers are right now there. So it's not like the time when we had very 
low numbers. Actually, the numbers are there. And I think uh, if the sample size, depending on what's the determination of the sample size, they can be able to get this and be able to conclude on that aspect. And then, as a country, we can be able to pronounce it. Marie, uh, to bring you in, um, we know uh, the country has gone through the first wave of COVID and the second wave. And there's a nexus between um, the COVID pandemic and mental health concerns. I know you've, you've, you've been out there and also gathered data in regard to the question of mental health. Uh, what exactly are you, uh, do, we, do you have in terms of you know, that survey? Thank you, Emmanuel. Um, so yes, we have, we collected data last year and also collected data in December and also in June last, last month. And from that data that we've collected, we do see that um, someone doesn't have to first tell you that I'm anxious about a specific issue, but you look at their uh, entire livelihood because we see that uh, at the moment, we have about 36% that say that they are confident they will get treated in case they got sick. That means that the other percentage, the balance of that, are people who are really anxious that if I got sick, I'm going to really be in great trouble. And what is it that makes them really anxious about that? We see that 26% say that the treatment is expensive. So that makes them quite nervous. Then the shortage of facilities, We've had uh, in a number of locations, there is no oxygen and so on. So that makes people really anxious. Then we've also looked at the issue of uh, food stress. At the moment, now that uh, people are really not going to work, a number of them, that creates uh, a burden for some of them because uh, you see that we, not, we take note that about 73% of those in the rural areas say that they, um, they don't have enough to take care of their daily needs. They don't have enough income to take care of their daily needs. And we see a similar number also mentioning that in the urban. So what we, ha we are seeing from this data is that the stress levels are really uh, triggered by a number of aspects, which means that until we have uh, a larger proportion of our population vaccinated, and we have more hope that we are able to go about our businesses normally, then the stresses, the stressors of uh, the people of Uganda will continue. And so um, we believe that it's about time that we have more emphasis on the aspect of mental health. Yes, maybe it has really been emphasized, but if at all someone is grieving or if someone is a uh, uh, not having enough income in their household, how can this person be helped to, to cope? Are those services free of charge? Are they available? Or someone has to actually pay money to get those services. So there were really quite a number of uh, issues that we looked at. We also looked at the issue of uh, the physical violence, emotional violence, uh, sexual violence, and we did see that at least uh, when we look back in November last year, about 50% uh, of the people that we spoke to said that they observed that this violence, physical, uh, emotional, sexual, had actually increased in their communities. And then when it came to the teenage pregnancy, 79% said that within their community, that had become worse. Now we know that schools have been closed for a while. So that is already a trigger for stress for most of the parents out there. And then we also look at the, uh, we looked at the alcohol consumption and then drug use. Again, even with this, we see that more than 50% said that they noticed that this situation got worse within their community. So it's really, important to emphasize that yes uh, this is going on but how can people deal with it is there a way that they can be uh, helped given the current challenges that they're not able to afford so many things in, in, in your view do you think um, basically 
this has amplified the fault line of uh, the s social classes that we have. And uh, many of these cases seem to be recorded, um, especially do things to do with domestic violence, financial distress, mm -hmm. to be recorded amongst uh, poor communities. Um, from what we have gathered, we have not really seen that much of, um, of a divide because we did see that those that mention having these um, the sexual violence, emotional violence, physical, and also the alcohol consumption, teenage pregnancy, the number was a bit higher in the urban compared to the rural. But urban poor, I guess. It, it could be. It could be. I would need to look at that again. But it's largely in the urban. Then when you look at the rural population, one of their key concerns is uh, having enough to take care of their families because the assumption is that you have a garden, you can easily feed your people, but the reality is that if at all the truck is too expensive to move my matoke to Kampala, that means I'm probably going to be selling a bunch at 500, yet before selling it like maybe at 5,000. So that means that both the rural and urban uh, population are going through the stress, but the question is for the rural person, are those services, uh, counseling services available for them? Uh, doctor, uh, to bring you in, um, where are we standing currently in terms of the second wave? Because we've heard that um, we've, we are seeing a, a decline in terms of numbers, and uh, towards the end of July or early August, is we'll have a peak and then a gradual decline. So in your estimate and uh, uh, based on, on science, um, Perhaps do we see, I mean, do we, do we start coming out of the woods towards the um, end of this month? Thank you for that question. Yes, uh, we are seeing a reduction in, uh, on the numbers, as I, as I indicated, that uh, as, of, as of today, there were less than 700 post new cases. And even in hospitalizations, we are less than 1,000, and yet he had gone to almost 1,300. But I, I must say that this is too early to, to call. You, you know that they are, there's an imp the impact of the lockdown, and definitely the numbers risk going up when we, when we do what? When we open up, if people do not adhere to the SOPs on, on put issues of putting on, on masks, so this is what we are seeing. We are yet to confirm whether it, it's going to be able to sustain it. The numbers will continue to do what? Will continue to reduce. But we are optimistic that definitely these numbers will, will move, if they could continue on the downward, down, downward, downward trade, it also will be able to reduce the pressure on the, on the health systems because if the numbers continue, they definitely will break the break the health system. So that's that's what 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 we are seeing is whether it will will sustain it. It will be another question. As we wrap this up, Doctor, uh, quickly um, discuss um, in terms of in regard to the question of um, the disease burden. Definitely, the, the COVID pandemic has you know. Um, has affected uh, health services in this country and uh, our hospitals are, are, have been placed in a chokehold. But how about the other patients? Uh, people are suffering from tub tuberculosis, HIV, uh, and the other ailments, cancer and the others. Um, how are we coping? And yet we seem to be uh, you know, prioritizing COVID. I must say that Uganda was one of those countries as early as March 2020, we established a specific pillar for continuity of essential services, so which I, I, I do chair, and we do track the number of indicators, over 21, 21 indicators on aspect of maternal and child malaria immunization, and looking at from the experience of the, of the first wave, we, we, we put a number of measures 
so that we do not get a repeat. And if you know that even from the lockdown, there was an emphasis of health workers and patients accessing facilities to be able to, to, to do that. So, yes, it has drawn some of our, our energy, I mean, resources, both human and infrastructure and all the others to COVID, but we have not forgotten the other diseases because we would not want that we lose more people from other diseases than COVID. So we are working on it. Marie, to wrap this up, uh, we know that uh, the COVID has uh, a long-term effect in terms of mental health on those who have suffered from it. Uh, you know, people uh, may need counseling services, people may need um, to speak to experts to help them heal. People are going through a lot of uh, challenges, financial distress, emotional distress, domestic violence. What do we need to do as a country to help those to cope uh, with all these mental health uh, challenges? Thank you, Emmanuel. So um, I think one of the things that uh, needs to be done is that we need to really talk about that a lot more, the mental health. But also we need to make sure that we have uh, platforms that can reach more people. Those that are less educated, those that are deep down in the rural locations, the village health teams, the, probably the, um, the chairpersons of that uh, community, so that in case somebody has lost uh, uh, a relative or a friend, they know how they can, they can be assisted on how to, to grieve, but there's a need to have more platforms reaching the masses so that they can uh, be helped in coping. Thank you very much, uh, dear viewers. You've been watching Citizen Voices, and I've been your host, Emmanuel Mutaiziwa. Till next time, uh, have a great evening. <laughs>